Hey, it's Jordan with Studio GBK, and today I take a slab of silver maple, bust it down, burn it, and turn it into a lava table. Everything went pretty well until I got the worst leak I've ever had during a pour, so stay tuned for that. Now, I bought this slab in March of 2023 for only $50, and the fact that it's cracked is what made it so cheap. I was actually buying some walnut when I noticed this piece on the side, and she was damaged and looked like she'd been through a lot, but I saw potential and decided to give it a chance. As you can see, I removed all of the bark from this slab first, and I wasn't sure on how I was going to break this up, and some of you might be wondering why I wanted this break up in the first place. Well, number one is because it's fun to break things, but jokes aside, I saw this beautiful table on Instagram that inspired this design, along with woodworkers in Russia or some country that I don't speak the language, making amazing volcanic tables, along with these patio tables, kitchen islands, and even rugs, which aren't real. They're AI generated, but I believe I'm capable of making something very close to it, and I will. So here's my first attempt. I thought of using a bat or a mallet, but instead I tightened this clamp to the side of my work table and smashed the pieces on top of it. I took the broken pieces and rearranged them in the same order as they were before I broke the slab to give it that explosion effect, and I put them on top of a piece of cardboard so I could trace this awkward shape and cut it out and begin making the mold. Now this is the strangest and most difficult mold I've ever built because it isn't square or rectangular like most molds typically are. It's live edge all the way around, so I wasn't sure how this would work out but I put that cardboard stencil on top of the white MDF board, traced the same shape all the way around, and cut along that line with my jigsaw. I just used some extra MDF that I had on hand, and I ended up using two different pieces to make that full shape. And I was actually pretty pleased with how close I was able to get it to the actual shape of the wood. I came back with my torch and burned all these pieces individually on the top, bottom, and sides. This took me like eight hours in total, and I could have used a more powerful torch to speed up the process, but I didn't want the pieces to warp. So I used this little torch, which stopped working midway through the process. After taking it apart and still having trouble, I bought a new one and managed to get all the pieces to that natural charred black color that I wanted. I sealed them all with art resin to preserve that color and protect them from moisture and water. And here's what they looked like when I finished. I let them dry for 72 hours and as you can see, the little drips and excess hardened at the bottom, but I just removed it with a chisel and the rest of it I sanded. After that, I was ready to build the mold, so I cocked in between those two pieces and connected them. Well, actually three pieces with that little guy there. I covered the entire surface with tuck tape so the epoxy doesn't bond to that white MDF board. Then I used this flexible garden edging to go around the perimeter of this mold. No, I did not come up with that idea myself. It was a tip from another woodworker. I put a bunch of caulking around the entire edge of the mold and used these drywall screws to attach it. It took a lot of them, but I was more worried about this thing leaking than I was about wasting screws. So I went pretty crazy with the screwing on this one. I was so worried about a leak that I came back with an extra bead of caulk after it was already screwed just to make sure that this was sealed to perfection. And if you're thinking about anything other than this mold right now and the wood that's about to go inside of it, you should probably get some help. Um, I cleaned off my finger and put those pieces back inside the mold. They fit pretty well, but the live edge is not shaped at a perfect 90 degree angle. So there were areas that I had to bend the garden edging so the pieces could sit flat. I used my torch to heat it and bend it and I even cut it in some areas and then used a bunch of tuck tape to control where the epoxy would go and attempted to make the perfect edge that I was going for. And at that point, I really didn't know if this would work or not, but I'm going for it. I used clamps and wood and red tape to hold these pieces and stop them from moving once I pour. Probably not the textbook way to do this, but feel free to comment with any ideas that you have. At this point, I'm ready to pour the table. Now my goal here is to color the epoxy as close to a volcanic lava fire color as possible. And this is my first attempt at a volcano table, so I'm hoping for the best. After looking at some pictures online, I remixed these high flow acrylics from Golden Pigment. I used naphthol red light and mixed it with pyrrole orange. And that just sounds like fire, doesn't it? So I mixed them all together with epoxy 
And to be honest, this turned out to be a bit more red than I wanted. And I would have added more orange, but I had already mixed in too much dye, which can affect the consistency and how well the epoxy dries. So I just poured it as is and hoped for the best. I also put some of that same epoxy in this ketchup looking bottle that you see here and use that to fill in these cracks and voids in the surface of the table. I could have just used clear, but I want the little cracks and veins in the wood to match these lava rivers that the table is made up of. And I wasn't too worried about getting it neat because I'll sand it later anyway. I just want to make sure the voids are all the way full. And as I did this on the surface, it started looking a bit more orange and lava-like. So I was actually pleased with how that color combination turned out. I also added some yellow pigment into the mix and spread it around with a piece of this popsicle stick. And at this point, I kind of wish that I'd given myself more space to work with because trying to swirl these lava designs into the epoxy with hardly any space was very challenging and even irritating later on when tons of it dried on my live edges and I had to come back and scrape it all off, which took hours. And I wanted to just let it go, but the perfectionist in me just wouldn't allow it. So I scraped and sanded and even recolored these black edges with a marker. After that, I mixed and poured the clear layer. And as you can see, this had way too many bubbles, but I was able to use my torch and heat gun to eliminate them. And I could have used that lava color all the way through, but my goal was to keep as much of the live edge visible as possible, which is why I poured the clear over the top of that lava river. And during this clear pour was when it started to leak. Oh my gosh. Why? And this is my first time dealing with a leak, so I wasn't sure what to do here. I've heard Flex Seal works, but I didn't have any on hand and I didn't have time to go grab it. So I just started covering that area with red tape as fast as I could. And after using a bunch of tape, it still kept on leaking. Oh, this is bad. Oh, this is fucking bad. This is all bad, dog. So I added more tape and more tape and layered tape on top of tape until I couldn't add any more. And after all that, it still dripped a little, but my tape job did minimize the leak. And I covered it to prevent dust or bugs from ruining the clear layer and left it to dry. When I came back, it actually dried fairly well and clear. And I was glad all my resin didn't leak out onto the floor, but it did have these clusters of bubbles that dried onto the surface. And you know, bubbles are cool and all when you're a kid, but in the epoxy game, they're the last thing you wanna see in your finish. They're also permanent, just like face tats. So I actually cut out this area that was really bad and filled it with black epoxy to make it look like it was a part of the wood rather than me being an amateur at pouring clear epoxy. And if you can't tell by now, I was really starting to regret this clear layer idea. And to top it off, when I poured the final layer of clear, it had even more bubbles than the previous layer and ruined any chances that I have of this looking like clear glass. And at this point, I just want to throw the whole thing away, but I kept going and removed all the screws, peeled off the garden edging, and took this out of the mold. Removing it from the mold was pretty easy. But I did have to cut off a bunch of excess clear epoxy that dried around the edges. Luckily, it was pretty soft because it hadn't fully cured, and after cleaning up those edges, I threw it in the back of my truck along with some other projects and took it to Ponderosa Millworks in Oakland to send it through the wide belt sander. These machines can cost well over $100,000, so being able to use this for $200 an hour is actually a really good deal. So when people ask me, hey bro, can I have a table for $200? I say, yeah, you can. Go to Ikea. They sell tables for $200, maybe less. Um, anyways, after sending it through the planer a couple times, it completely removed the black charred layer that I had worked so hard to burn, and I did not see this one coming. And this was just another issue out of many with this table. 
So I took it back to my shop and cut off more of that clear epoxy that had dried around the edges. And I sanded both sides down as smooth as possible to remove those lines. But at this point, I was just done with this table and I felt like cutting it up and throwing it away. But instead of doing that, I let it sit in my shop for months, started some new projects, and just recently decided that I'd do my best to finish it even though it's not exactly what I want. So I flipped it over and decided to use the bottom side as the surface, even though this wasn't the original plan. And this led to me cutting off even more of that clear epoxy from the edges. And I just wondered, is this still considered a natural live edge? Or is it considered a GMO unnatural edge now that I've interfered with it? Let me know in the comments. I sanded the whole thing down, some of it by hand, the rest with my orbital sander. And after sanding it all the way up to 400 grit, I used this true black wood stain from Home Depot to stain the wood black and bring it back to that original color that I wanted when I first started burning it. Now this is obviously artificial, but I'm happy with how close this color is to the original color that I had wanted. I stained the bottom first to get some practice strokes in, and the bottom won't really be seen much, but you never know when someone might have their face down there cleaning or whatever, and if they do, I would want them to be impressed. I flipped it over and stained the top of this table, which used to be the bottom, and this really brought out my artistic side more than any other project that I've done. I used a tiny paintbrush to make sure I stayed inside the lines, and I remember being forced to color things back in elementary school, which I always thought was stupid, but little did I know this was a valuable skill that would be very useful later in life. After staining the whole thing, this is how it looked, which is not bad for a piece that I almost gave up on. Um, the stain dried a little rougher than I wanted, and I didn't want to sand it off and ruin that black finish again. So I just went over it with this 3000 grit sanding pad to make it smooth again, and this actually worked out pretty well. After that, I was ready to attach the legs. I used these 28 inch hairpin legs, and I could have done something much fancier, but at this point, I just want to be done. I spread these legs out exactly where I want them to be and used framing squares to make them somewhat symmetrical. This is to help with balance. I marked the location of the holes with a sharp ice pick because marker or pencil would be hard to see on this black finish. And then I drilled the holes for my threaded inserts. A threaded insert basically allows the legs to be removed and reattached hundreds or thousands of times versus screwing straight into wood, you can only remove them a small amount of times. Now, when I went to screw them in, they busted prematurely before they were even all the way in, which is never a good thing. The big mistake here is that I used brass threaded inserts when I should have used steel. Silver maple is a hardwood, plus this has tons of epoxy in it, so these soft brass threaded inserts just couldn't take the pressure. I drilled bigger holes and was able to get some of them in, but others broke off and I had to remove them with vice grips. Some were in deep enough that I just sanded them down. And after messing with this table for a whole year, here I am cursing at it and calling it names, which is really not how I wanted this to end. But after fighting with these inserts, I managed to get them all in and attach the legs successfully. And if you're wondering, this is how it felt. After that, I finished this off using mineral oil and a rag. I thought of doing a clear coat, but I refused to give this table any more of my time. And after all the struggle, I'm really happy with how this one turned out and how much it resembles lava in certain places. A volcano was the goal, but my girl said it's a Darth Vader table. And using AI, here's how it would look in your house or maybe even a private beach. Let me know what you think in the comments and subscribe if you enjoyed this video. Thanks for watching. See you on the next one.